Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Son of the Heavenly Father, it was pleasing in your eyes to become the Son of the ever-Virgin Mary. And so the Archangel Gabriel came to announce the good tidings, bringing the peace of the Father to the one who is blessed among all women. Prepare us to celebrate your glorious birth with joy and with gladness, then we, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who sent Gabriel to Nazareth as a messenger, and to the Son who dwelt within the Virgin Mary as the Gospel, and to the Spirit who sanctified her and accomplished this wondrous mystery. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Glory to you, O exalted one, for you chose to live among us. You are the power who dwelt within the pure and ever-Virgin Mary and appeared from her as God incarnate. Today we cry out, proclaiming, Blessed are you, O Mary, because the Son of God has chosen you as his mother. Blessed are you, O Mary, because of you Adam has been freed. Blessed are you, O Mary, because you are the glory of the nations and the pride of all generations. Now, word of God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense and in your mercy to pardon our faults and give us the gifts of your spirit. Grant security to your flock and peace to your monasteries and convents. Piety to priests and purity to deacons, dignity to the elderly and generosity to parents, restraint to the youth and a good formation to children. Sanctify the monks and nuns and spread truth and charity throughout the world. Grant rest to the departed in your eternal kingdom, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Spirit would descend, and the Lord's power from on high would come down and dwell in you. He will reign in Jacob's house, and his kingdom will not end. All the peoples of the earth will sing praise from age to age to the Savior who is God. O pure Virgin Mary, you are the cloud who has dropped down the dew upon the earth, filling it with the sweet fragrance of Christ. On this feast of your Annunciation, implore your only Son with us to accept our incense, and to fill us with his heavenly graces, that we may thank him, his Father, and his Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Kodishan <speaking in Hebrew> sent to earth this day to announce to the virgin you shall bear the one who says reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, in human terms, I say that no one can annul or amend, even a human will once ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his descendant, it does not say into descendants as referring to many, but as referring to one, and to your descendant, who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law, which came 435 years afterward, does not annul a covenant pre previously ratified by God, so as to cancel the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it is no longer from a promise but God bestowed it on Abraham through a promise. Why then the law? It was added for transgressions until the descendant came to whom the promise had been made. It was, prom it was promulgated by angels at the hand of a mediator. Now there is no mediator. 
when only one party is involved and God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Of course not. For if a law had been given out that could bring life, then righteousness would in reality come from the law. But scripture confined all things under the power of sin, that through faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled at what was said, and she pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be so, since I do not know man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren, for nothing shall be impossible to God. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the truth, peace be with you.
May it be done to me according to your word. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So in our anaphoras and often through our prayers, we have references always to the plan of salvation, also known as the divine economy, in a bit more fancier terms. The idea is how God unfolds. The economy, as we've mentioned before, is in the Greek actually the government of a household, oikos, nomos. So economy is originally how things are organized within a household. So the Greek terminology is the divine economy, how God unfolds and manifests his plan of salvation. The divine economy, the plan of salvation. And central to this, as we have with the season of announcements, is word, spoken, articulated, conceived. So you have a long reflection on word in the bulletin this week. But also central, and it's important for us, the announcement to Mary on this Sunday, is that wedding is central to God's entire divine plan. Wedding in the sense not of marriages with throwing rice, but wedding in the sense of coupling, bringing together to bring forth life. This is why in Genesis you have two recountings of the, of the creation of male and female, the creation of the image of God, singular, but then is spoken of as being plural. Male and female, he created them. It is not so much about those two people. It is about the notion of the union between the two. And so from that moment in Genesis until the book of Revelation, which finishes with the wedding of the Lamb, the whole notion of what wedding is, this union, is from start to finish. So that ish and isha, which are the Hebrew terms for man and woman, you just have the term taken from the same term ish, ish and isha. They are created in order to be a reflection of what God's plan ultimately for the salvation of the world is, which is union, which is wedding. Which is why in Israel, you have the whole image of wedding that takes place with the rising of the prophets, the great prophets. Referring to Israel as being the spouse of God, the virgin of Yahweh, the bride of Yahweh, the spouse of, our, uh, the spouse of God. And the imagery which is used so that when Israel goes after these idols, goes after these false religions, she's referred to as being an adulteress because wedding is the center of the plan of God, of the plan of salvation. And this whole theme builds throughout the Old Testament, bringing it to the fulfillment in the coming of the Messiah who refers to himself directly as being the bridegroom. So wedding is everywhere throughout. This is why when the Messiah comes, he elevates that union of a man and a woman to the level of mystery, because it is the reflection of God's entire plan from the dawn of creation until the end of the world is wedding. It's central. That is why the church is referred to as being the spouse of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. You have this overlapping that takes place. When St. Paul writes to the Galatians, when he writes to the Ephesians, he talks about how a man is to love his wife as his own body, and as Christ sacrificed himself for his spouse, so he is supposed to sacrifice himself for his own wife. So he uses this image of the coupling of what in the Old Testament is being foreshadowed between Israel and God between its fulfillment during this time of the church, which is the fulfillment of Israel, which is the new Israel, which is the bridal festival that we are turned towards on the final day of the wedding of the Lamb. The parables that our Lord gives of the king who gives a wedding feast for his son. Wedding is central to all of these things. But wedding is not about individual contentment of finding. It is meant to be the union that is brought together in God's plan to bring forth life. That's its ultimate and fundamental meaning. Now we bring all this up because in the Old Testament, you have references to Israel and the terminology that's used of the daughter of Zion, of the virgin of Zion, 
This imagery that's used of Israel is fulfilled in the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our Lady, if you look through the Old Testament, with its imagery of the wedding, of joining together, the prophet Jeremiah will use the imagery of the Exodus as being the period of courtship. Forty years you followed me through the wilderness. This imagery that is used, but if you look at the Old Testament, everything is being chiseled down. You go from the creation of Ish and Isha, of man and woman in Genesis, to being chiseled down from all of humanity, down to the Hebrews, down to the family of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the 12 sons that come from there of Israel. And then of the 12, then you have the family of Judah, the tribe of Judah, excuse me. And then from the tribe of Judah, the family of David. And of the family of David, you come down to the individual Mary of Nazareth. You continually bring down to, you have the personification, the very person who comes to represent everything that is meant to have been in the plan of salvation. That is what the announcement to the ever Virgin Mary of Nazareth is meant to mean. Mary is in this instance in the incarnation of the announcement being made to her by the angel Gabriel is actually spousal. Her relationship to God, she is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies. She is the perfect embodiment of Israel, of what Israel was always meant to be. She is the daughter of Zion personally. She is the virgin of Zion personally. And she will fulfill that wedding with God, with the divine word. We've talked about this before. Perhaps we'll, in, the, in the next year we'll come back to it. But Mary of Nazareth has simultaneously a spousal and a maternal relationship to the divinity, to God. She is both the virgin of Zion, she is the daughter of Zion, and in that wedding, be it done unto me according to your word. That union between her and God brings about that she will also be mother. This is why when our Lord talks to her in the time in St. John's Gospel, and remember St. John's Gospel is filling in holes of things that are not spoken of in the other three Gospels. It's there where St. John wants us to see that at the beginning of our Lord's ministry and at the end, at his death on Calvary, she is referred to as being woman. She is the new Isha. She is the new Eve, as the fathers always call her, because he is the new Adam. So while she is in historical time mother to this child that is born, this child is the divine word to whom she is wed. This is an espousal that takes place in the announcement, the annunciation. I know you have to think about it for a while and kind of wrap your head around it, but it's quite extraordinary to see that this one woman is the fulfillment of everything that a human being was supposed to be. She is not only, and that is why she was made immaculate, why she was created pure. She is the new Eve created in that state to bring the fulfillment that initiates the entrance into this world of the bridegroom himself that prepares the time that we live in now, which is a preparation and a direction towards the fulfillment of glory in the wedding of the Lamb. So these are just a few of the things to think about as you read this first chapter of St. Luke throughout this week. To go back and see what this woman, how she reacts, what she, is, what is she is doing here, is this is the proposal of the divine economy. This is the wedding of the plan of salvation. Which is why when the angel comes to her, she's troubled not by seeing an angel, we're not told that she sees anything, she hears that when he arrives to her, he calls her, in the Greek, the term is kekaritomene. Kekaritomene is a made up word in Greek. It doesn't exist in Greek. I mean, it exists in Greek, but it's what we call a neologism. It's a word that is created specifically to say something that is a concept that we've not normally described. And kekaritomene, it literally means the one who has been gracified. But it's one word, it's being used as her proper name. Hail kekaritomine. That's why we're told she's troubled by this greeting, 
what this is supposed to mean. And then the angel, clearly she's overwhelmed by this salutation, which is why he then says to her, do not be afraid, Miriam. Do not be afraid, Mary. He uses her personal name to call her back to understand God has chosen you. You have found great favor with God. And the name which was given to her that we translate as full of grace, as a phrase, is only one word in the Greek, as a proper name. The one who has been gracified. The only other time that we see the word used in its root form of gracification is when St. Paul uses it in his later epistles referring to the church. That this body of Christ that has been gracified, you have been gracified in your baptism and in your calling. That terminology has been made into a, a rather kind of blunt form of a participle in Greek grammatically to use as a proper name for this woman. So when you pray the Hail Mary and you have that term full of grace, know that that is the core of the salutation to this woman in Nazareth. Kekaritomine. And that is why then when he tells her of all this will take place, of the power of the Most High and the spirit of holiness coming upon you and the one that shall be born of your womb shall be called Son of God. She simply answers the question in her virginity, in her purity, in her clarity of thought. She is the first human being from Adam and Eve who have no shadows in their minds. The rest of us, we bumble around, right? We don't get it. We're at school. We got to kind of study, read it a bit more. I don't know. This is so boring. And then we go back and read it again because there's a test coming. We go through this whole process because it's hard for us to get things to stick. The image I usually use is a bit like throwing mud at the wall. Eventually, you hope some of it sticks. That's learning. But the Blessed Virgin Mary as the new Eve, she is exactly what the human person is supposed to be with clarity of thought. She knows the prophecies. She knows the teachings of the rabbis. She knows the Old Testament. She knows the law of God. She knows all these things of the coming of the Messiah who will also suffer. And in seeing these things, to say that I'm going to have a child, this is, a whole, this is another sermon. And why is it that Joseph and Mary, who are married, are living as brother and sister? But that's another sermon of a current of spirituality running through Israel, contemporary with the coming of our Lord. But be that as it may, the reality is there that they live as brother and sister, which is why her answer to the angel first is, how will this take place since, since I do not know man? I don't have relations. How shall I have a child? And so that response of the angel Gabriel, that this is the work of God, and that you who were not with child by choice in your virginity, your cousin who was barren without child, not by choice, is now with child. That is your sign. And that will be the visitation that we will consider next week. But that he just simply says, don't worry yourself. Nothing is impossible to God. You can be virgin and mother, and this is the way it will be. And then she just simply says, I am the servant. I am the handmaid of God. This is that committal of person to person, which is wedding. That commitment of one individual to another, that is wedding. When Adam sees the Eve, he says, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. She is what I am in my very essence. And we have that echo with the Blessed Virgin Mary saying, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me as you say, according to your word. So contemplate these things and understand the greatness of who this woman is. That she is central to the whole plan of salvation as the fulfillment of the old law, as the archetype, we can say, of the church, of what the church is meant to be and what we are meant to be individually in our own personal lives as members of that church. That we say each day, I am the servant of God. May his plan of salvation and the divine economy be accomplished in me and through me for his greater honor 
and for the salvation, not only of my own soul, but of the bringing of healing to those around me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, 
Grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom on page 876, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. You are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. 
Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. You are adored by all angels, bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness. May we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Let's give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and sweet and sweet melodies proclaiming. Do this 
this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness, as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, the body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, of forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and apostolic church which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully 
with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. For the poor and the dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and the distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who please you and profess your name, we pray to you, O Lord. faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world. Grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will that in all sin and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity, and he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, as saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion, 
By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo Elokuluchun. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for a new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, 
for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. And we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el kulukhun, amruho diloh. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.